difficult thing that God asked you to do. He's not just trying to make you miserable. He's trying to get you in a place where He can do so much more in your life than what you could ever possibly imagine. Tonight I want to talk to you about a merciful and a forgiving attitude. I've just recently written a book called Do Yourself a Favor and Forgive. And just in the process of writing that book, I was just reminded and refreshed in my heart again about how important it is that we are not angry Christians. An angry Christian is an oxymoron. Do you know that? I looked up the word love the other day in the Greek dictionary. I like to study love real frequently because it keeps me moving in that direction and I know that's the will of God. So I looked up the word love again just to kind of refresh myself and one of the things that it said is that love is the central theme of Christianity. Now, bitterness and resentment and unforgiveness is not love. Anger is not love. So if love is the central theme of Christianity, then how can we be angry Christians and think that's okay? And you know, just because we come to church and put a smile on our face when we hit the church door, that doesn't mean that we don't have anger issues. Some of you don't, but many of you may have been angry when you walked in here. You may have even come with somebody that you're angry at. You may have already gotten angry about something since you got in the building. You didn't get the seat you wanted. They didn't sing the song you hoped they would sing. You, the lights bother you. Or, you know, we, we get angry about some of the goofiest, most ridiculous things. Now, I want you to listen to me because this is very important tonight. Most of the ground that Satan gains in the life of a believer is gained through the open door of unforgiveness. Most of the ground that Satan gains in the life of the believer is gained through that open door of unforgiveness. Let's look at two scriptures. 2 Corinthians 2, 10 and 11. And these, of course, are going to be up on the, the screens for you. I teach, as you probably know, from an Amplified Bible. If you forgive anyone anything... This is the Apostle Paul talking. If you forgive anyone anything, I too forgive that one. And what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, has been for your sakes. In the presence and with the approval of Christ the Messiah. Now verse 11, he's going to say why he's so willing to forgive. And why he wants them to be so willing to forgive. To keep Satan from getting an advantage over us. For we are not ignorant of his wiles and intentions. It's possible, just possible, that some of you here tonight who have some kind of a problem in your life, somehow or another the enemy has gotten in. You may be praying and asking God to remove that problem, but yet you have not been willing to forgive someone that has hurt you. You can't get your prayers answered. If you're not going to forgive. Well, Joyce, you don't know how I feel. I don't mean this to be rude, but I'm just going to say it. I don't really care how you feel. <laughs> and I don't mean that like I don't care like I don't care. But I mean, we have to get over caring so much about how we feel. I wish we could feel good all the time. But the truth is, is we're not going to feel good all the time. And one of the scriptures I'm going to read you a little bit later is in Colossians. And it says, to put on... Mercy. To put on mercy. And do you know that you can purposely choose to be merciful? Now, mercy is not fair. I mean, there's nothing fair about mercy. Because when you're merciful, you're giving somebody something that they don't deserve. You're deciding to let something go that if you just wanted to be really legalistic about it, you could just say, well, I am just not going to let you get by with that because what you did was wrong. But the Bible says to put on mercy and above all that you put on, to put on love. 
And one of the most valuable things in my life in the last 10 or 15 years is to learn to do what's right on purpose. Not because I feel like it, but to do it on purpose. And actually to learn even further that when I do what's right, when I don't feel like doing what's right, that's when I'm actually growing spiritually. When I do what's right because I feel like it and it's easy and it's not a struggle, then I'm operating in something that I've already grown in at some other time when I was doing what was right when it was hard. So don't think it's always going to be easy to do the right thing, but just remember when you are doing the right thing and it's difficult to do it, the good news is, is you can say, I'm growing. I am growing spiritually by making the right choice. Don't be weary in well-doing. Ephesians 4, 26. When you're angry, don't sin. I like that because you can be angry and not sin. Anger itself is not necessarily a sin. It's actually emotion that God has put in us to let us know when we're being mistreated. So anger is not necessarily a sin. It's what we do with that anger that becomes a sin. Don't ever let your wrath, your exasperation, your fury, or your indignation last until the sun goes down. Wow. Wonder how many people are here in church tonight worshiping God, praying for their needs to be met that went to bed angry last night. You know, you can be home and have a fight with your spouse, and you can go to bed angry even though the Holy Spirit's dealing with you and you know full well that you should humble yourself and go to them and try to make it right even if it's not your fault because that's the big one isn't it well it's not my fault and they need to come to me when God tells us to forgive people he's not really just trying to find something difficult for us to do so he can sit back and watch us sweat Everything, now listen to this, if you didn't come for anything but this tonight, this will be worth you being here. Everything that God asked you to do is something that if you do it will benefit you in the long run. Everything, everything, every hard thing that God is asking you to do right now, if there's something he's asking you to give up, or something he's asking you to do that you don't want to do. He's asking you to stay somewhere where you'd love to run away from. Or stick with a person that you would love to just get away from. Every difficult thing that God asks you to do. He's not just trying to make you miserable. He's trying to get you in a place where he can do so much more in your life than what you could ever possibly imagine. And I'm just praying that God will use my mouth tonight. To get somebody to understand that you have to get beyond all these feelings of anger and feelings of bitterness and, and feelings of not wanting to, to talk to somebody that's hurt your feelings. And you have to do the greater thing and do it God's way. Because if you can get all of the strife and all the bitterness and resentment and anger out of your life and you can keep it out of your life you will be absolutely amazed at what God will be able to do for you I wonder how many people maybe are praying for that miracle but they've not been willing to let go of that thing you'd be shocked really to know how many people are sitting in here tonight wonderful Lakewood people people from around this area you sing the songs, you have the bumper sticker. <laughs> you have your Christian jewelry on. You brought your Bible and maybe your 26 translation Bible. I don't know. You will buy the CD, but yet you're mad at somebody. You don't really think that anybody else should be mad at anybody, but in your case, it's justified. Because after all, we just don't understand what happened to you. Well, you know, when Jesus was being crucified, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. When Paul was being stoned, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And if we can come to the point of understanding what I'm getting ready to share with you, I believe it can be life-changing. Something that God whispered in my heart last year a few times, I'm just like, wow. He said, Joyce, when somebody hurts you, you need to be a lot more concerned about what they're doing to themselves 
than what they're doing to you. Because you see, God doesn't take it very kindly when people hurt his children. We got any moms and dads in here? How do you act when somebody hurts one of your kids? I mean, I get like, <laughs> oh, you do just about anything but hurt one of my kids. I'm going to have a hard time being a Christian on that day. <laughs> Amen. And God does not like it when people are unjust and unkind to his children and when they judge them and criticize them and do ungodly things to them. And I really believe that we need to learn. That's why the Bible says to pray for your enemies. We need to pray for our enemies because really what they did to us can't really do much to us if we don't let it. They're the ones that need the help. Don't let the sun go down on your anger anymore. Now here you're going to say, well, I can't help how I feel. I can't help how I feel. We're not talking about how you feel. We're talking about the decision you make. Do you know that I have found out that if I get mad at Dave, that I can go in the room and talk to him whether I feel like it or not? And you see, when you're mad at somebody, the first thing you want to do is shut them out of your life. Up goes the walls. I mean, I, you know, I go out the front door and walk around and come in the back door rather than have to walk through the room where he's at. Come on, is anybody with me tonight? <laughs> but I have found out that I can choose to walk in that room and say, are you enjoying the football game? Can I get you something to drink? Love you, I'm going to bed. Quickly. <laughs> How many of you believe that all this anger stuff is a big problem for Christians? Well, you know what? We have got to do something about it. Each one of us has to take responsibility personally to say, I am not going to live angry. Now, you cannot always do anything about how you feel, but you can do something about what you do because you have free choice. And if we do the right thing long enough, our feelings will follow along later. I'm going to say that again. If we do the right thing long enough, our feelings will follow along later. One of the things that happens when you pray for your enemies is it gets really hard to stay mad at somebody that you're praying for. And so you can start by doing that. Praying for people that hurt you. Pray for them. And another thing you can do when you're angry is get the word out and study in that area. You know, if, if I've got a headache, I don't stick a Band-Aid on my head. And when you're angry at somebody, you don't need a message on prosperity. You need to get in here and you need to study anger and bitterness and resentment and unforgiveness. And you need to study it and study it until the word breaks through and breaks that bondage off of you. Then your prosperity will follow suit. Seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, the right way of being and doing. And all of these things will be added unto you. Seek the kingdom, seek to do things the way God wants you to do them, and God will add the blessings. You don't have to chase blessings, let them chase you. Amen. Philippians 2.5 says that we are to take on the same attitude that Jesus had. And it goes on to talk about how he humbled himself. You know, humility, I think, is probably the most beautiful attitude that we can work to develop. Probably one of the hardest to come by. But true humility is probably one of the most beautiful attributes and attitudes that Jesus wants to teach us. And I believe that it's impossible to be merciful without humility. Not too long ago, I'm sad to say, I got madder than I've been in a long time. I was actually shocked at how mad I got. It was at a relative, not Dave, thank God. <laughs> Dave and I have been married so long now, we just don't even bother getting mad. <laughs> just 44 years last January, it's like, why fight? <laughs> but I got mad at somebody, I'm not going to go into, into all the details, I did tell the story in full in the book that I just wrote, but 
I felt like the person was just really, really, really being ridiculous and putting undue pressure on me at a time when I didn't need undue pressure and I just asked them to do a simple little thing and they had to, you know, have a cow over it and I was just like, I, did, I mean, I just blew up. And I don't normally do that. And I told her off. <laughs> and I told everybody what she did to me. <laughs> I told Dave, I told my, I called my kids up and told my kids. Which is one of the things that's a no-no, we're going to talk about that tonight, because love covers. Love doesn't expose, love covers. Love tries to protect somebody else's relationship, it doesn't try to ruin it. But I was so mad that I not only didn't want to like her, I didn't want anybody else to like her. Doesn't it make you mad when you're, when somebody has hurt you and you're with somebody else who knows them and they start telling you how nice they are? <laughs> Don't you want to just say, well, you, let me tell you a thing or two. <laughs> so anyway, I mean, I was firm and I felt justified in my anger. And so three days went by. I kept waiting for her to call me and apologize. No phone call. One morning I was praying. You know, it's hard to pray when you're not obeying God. Because when you pray, he's likely to say something to you you don't want to hear. So I was praying one morning, and I guess enough days had gone by now that God could finally get through to me a little bit. And he started putting on my heart that he wanted me to call her and apologize to her. <laughs> I, was just, I can tell you, I just went, oh, God, no. No, 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 no. Please not this time. Could you make somebody else do what's right and not me? This woman is a Christian too. So I waited a while longer. I was just sure that, you know, she was going to use it as, well, yes, you did hurt me, and yes, you did me, and yes, you did me. So I even just said, okay, God, I'm going to do this because I love you and I want to be obedient to you. But would you please at least have her say, I was wrong too. <laughs> I thought, well, maybe I can do this if I don't have to take the full brunt of the responsibility. So I called halfway hoping she wouldn't answer the phone because a lot of times she doesn't. <laughs> but lo and behold, she was home that day, of course, to talk to me. And, you know, I just, I, I said, you know, listen, I just want to tell you that I'm sorry I got so angry the other day. And I mean, right away she said, you know what? No, don't, don't think anything about it. She said, I didn't act right either. And it was just so nice. And then it was just like, whew, all that pressure left. I could pray. I was working on my book. And so that helped. <laughs> But I couldn't have done that if I wouldn't have been willing to have humbled myself and let her think that I would, you know, I didn't really think I was wrong. But I realized that even though what she did was wrong for me to respond that way was just as wrong. See, even when somebody does something wrong to you, the anger that you have and begin to spew around is just as wrong. I think that we need to develop a much more easygoing attitude. And you know, in the natural, I wouldn't be a real easygoing person, but I've developed a lot more of that attitude in my life. You know why? It's just really hard on you if you don't get to the point sooner or later where you can just be a little more easygoing and not just make mountains out of molehills and not have to have everything a certain way in your life. There's a scripture that I absolutely love. I think it's one of the most beautiful portions of scripture in the Bible, and it's found in Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, overburdened, and I will cause you to rest. I will ease and relieve and refresh your souls. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle, meek, and humble, lowly in heart. Isn't that beautiful? Humble, gentle, meek, and lowly. And then I love the rest of it. He says, you will find ease and refreshment 
and recreation and blessed quiet for your souls. See, the minute I was willing to humble myself and apologize to somebody just for the sake of peace, even though I thought she should be apologizing to me, the reward that I got immediately was rest for my soul. Ease and quiet for my soul. For my yoke is wholesome, useful, good, and I love this part in the Amplified Bible. It is not harsh, hard, sharp, or pressing. I was raised by a man, my father, who was very harsh and hard and quick-tempered and sharp. And any time you were around him, there was nothing but pressure. And sad to say, I became a lot like that in the earlier years of my life very legalistic you know if you're not merciful then you're going to be legalistic you can't be both you're either going to be legalistic or you're going to be merciful and to be legalistic means that you have certain specific expectations of people and situations and if those expectations are not met then you are going to get upset and normally you are going to let somebody know them now obviously we want to expect good things we want to expect the best out of life. But I'll tell you something that we cannot expect out of people, and that's perfection. We are not perfect. We're not going to find a perfect church. We're not going to find a perfect job. You're not going to find somebody perfect to be married to. You're not going to find a perfect kid. If we were perfect, we would not need Jesus. We all, A-double-L, -L, all have weaknesses. We all have strengths. But we also all have weaknesses. And that's why the Bible is filled with the message that we must be quick to forgive. We must be generous with our forgiveness. We must always believe the best of every person. And we must, we must, we must, we must develop a merciful attitude where our first response is, you know what, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. I make mistakes too. Instead of, what? How could you do that to me? And what's the tone behind that? How could you be so dumb to make that kind of a mistake and wound perfect me? But see, a humble person knows what a mess they are. A humble person knows that if it were not for the grace of God, the mercy of God, the love of God, the forgiveness of God, the kindness of God, oh my gosh, what a shape we would be in. That's why the story in Matthew is so important. When Peter said, how many times shall I forgive my brother? I love that. How many times shall I forgive my brother? I guess Peter thought he had a limit. And I know we all think, and I think this, you know, if you do that one more time, <laughs> then I have reached my limit. And Jesus went on to tell a story about a man who couldn't pay his debt. And he asked to be forgiven, and his master forgave him. And then that same man, that same man, <laughs> Come on, if you're mad tonight, you are that man. <laughs> I said, if you're angry tonight, you are that man. Because you could not pay your debt, and you asked God to forgive you, and he forgave you quickly. He was merciful to you, and will be merciful to you and to me every time that we go to him with our weaknesses. Every time, he'll be merciful to us. So how can we then refuse to forgive people who hurt us? Hmm. It's quiet in here. <laughs> what are your expectations of people? Dave and I had so many problems for so many years until we finally just accepted each other the way that we, we were. And we actually had a meeting in the kitchen 
and shook hands and looked at each other and I said, I accept you the way you are. And he said, and I accept you the way you are. Now that doesn't mean that we didn't both need change. But you know what? Only God can change people. You're not going to change somebody by being mad about them being the way that they are because they may change for a while to try to suit you, but if God doesn't do a work in their heart, whatever it is they were doing that you demanded they stop is just going to pop up somewhere else. Maybe in a different way, but it'll pop up somewhere else. That's why it's so much better to pray for people. And yes, you can talk to people. You know, mercy doesn't mean that you never confront. Jesus confronted. He confronted people. He confronted issues, but he still loved the people. You have to learn to not expect everybody in your life to be perfect. Because you know what? None of us are. Mercy doesn't mean that you never confront. Jesus confronted. He confronted people. He confronted issues, but he still loved the people. You have to learn to not expect everybody in your life to be perfect. Because you know what? None of us are. In John 2, 24 and 25, there's a scripture that has meant a lot to me in my walk with God and especially in trying to learn how to deal with people. You know, we have over 900 employees in our ministry around the world. And when you're dealing with 900 people, there's always somebody that's doing something that you wish they weren't doing. If you're dealing with three people, there's usually somebody doing something you wish that they weren't doing. Sometimes if you're only dealing with one person, there's somebody doing something. How many of you agree that getting along with people and staying in peace and staying in love and staying out of anger is something you just got to work at? We all agree about that. So, we all need this message. But Jesus, for his part, verse 24 did not trust himself to them, he's talking about his disciples, because he knew all men. Now it doesn't say he didn't trust them, it says he didn't trust himself to them. And what I get out of that is he did not just throw his heart wide open to them and just say, you guys are my best buddies and we're going to hang out together and I can tell you anything and trust you and you're never going to hurt me and you're never going to disappoint me. You're my perfect friends that I've been looking for all my life. He didn't do that. Why? Because he knew all men. Verse 25, and he did not need anyone to bear witness concerning man. He needed no evidence from anyone about men, for he himself knew what was in human nature. I love that. You know, I think if you can just start a new job and just have a little chat with yourself before you go and say, you know what, this job's not going to be perfect. My boss not going to be perfect. I'm not going to work with perfect people. And I'm not perfect. So I think I'll just go in every day and have a merciful attitude. See, you need to set your mind and keep it set. It's so helpful to us if we don't have wrong expectations. Because when you have a wrong expectation, then you're just setting yourself up for all kinds of pain and agony. Well, you're the last person in the world that I would ever thought would have hurt me. <laughs> Well, see, you had a wrong expectation. Because if you hang out with anybody long enough, you're going to find something about them that you don't like. Anybody can stand anything for a short period of time. But when you've got that day after day after day after day after day after day after day, come on, I think that's why Peter said, Lord, how many times? And this is my own personal opinion, but I believe that Peter had a problem with John. Because I know Peter's personality. I'm not writing a new chapter in the Bible. But listen, I know Peter's personality. And I know when John said, I'm the disciple whom Jesus loves. I can tell you right now that that grated on Peter. And I can just see when John would just... Lean on Jesus at dinner and say, I'm the one he loves. I bet Peter just wanted to knock his lights out. Now, that's just my opinion. But I mean, these disciples were together for three years, day and night. Of course they had issues with one another. 
The, the more you're around somebody, the more you're going to see their flaws. That's why you have to start praying for and working with the Holy Spirit to develop an attitude of mercy toward people's failures. The disciples were a mess. And Jesus constantly forgave them. They argued over which of them was the greatest. <laughs> They fell asleep when Jesus needed them to pray one hour. <laughs> Peter denied Jesus three times. And yet, Jesus gave him mercy. On resurrection morning, he said, go and tell my disciples and Peter. Peter's the only one he mentioned by name. Go and tell my disciples, oh yeah, I'm Tell Peter too. I'm not mad at him. He's still in the group. Even though he denied me three times. You know why? You know why Jesus was not mad at those disciples? Because mercy understands the why behind the what. Legalism only looks at what people do, but God looks beyond what we do to why we do it. And that's why he can be so patient and long-suffering with us and work with us toward our healing. God put up with a lot of stuff off of me for a long time because he knew how I'd been raised and he knew how I had been treated and he knew that I had a good heart toward him but I just had a problem with strongholds in my flesh because of being mistreated. Jesus understood that the disciples had fear. Peter had fear. He was afraid of man. They were afraid. Mercy sees the why behind the what. You know, Jesus is confrontational and yet he's merciful. Because one of the worst things that you can do is have a heart full of unforgiveness. It messes up your prayer life. It messes up your fellowship with God. It messes up your anointing. It opens the door for the devil in your life. It makes you physically sick. And what, if you have problems in your life, and you're praying for a breakthrough, please examine your heart and ask yourself if there's anybody that you're mad at. The Bible says when you bring your gift to the altar, if your brother has ought against you, you lay your gift at the altar before you try to offer it to God and you first go and make peace with your brother. Then you come back and offer a gift. I don't think that we should be worshiping God with anger in our heart. I don't think that's real worship. And I remember standing in the front row when Dave and I were in the church that we went to for so many years where our ministry started, and I wasn't really in much of any kind of ministry yet. I was just teaching some home Bible studies. And I mean, we'd argue going to church, you know, if the devil can get anything started in your life, it'll be when you're trying to get ready to go hear the word because he'd rather that you just be in turmoil inside so you can't get anything out of it and sit there and wear your church face and smile at everybody and hallelujah, praise the Lord and, you know, while inside you're seeing. And I can actually remember, and I had no idea then what I was doing, but I understand it now. I can remember standing next to Dave in church with my big praise the Lord smile on looking at the words on the overhead, mouthing those words and singing the songs with my hands in the air, thinking if he thinks I'm going to cook him anything to eat today, he has got another thing coming. As far as I'm concerned, he can starve. He's just going to go home and watch another football game and I'm going to do nothing but do all the work and clean the house and I am sick and tired of the way I'm treated around here. And it's the hidden man of the heart that God's concerned about, not a show that we put on, but the hidden man of the heart. <laughs> Lord Jesus, help us. Stop worrying about somebody taking advantage of you and just start obeying God. Let him be your vindicator. Let him deal with your enemies. God is our vindicator. But if we keep trying to take care of ourselves, then he can't take care of us. Come on, are you mad at your boss? Are you mad at that person at office that got the promotion that you felt like you deserved? <laughs> are you
Are you still mad at your parents and now they're in their 80s and you still won't call them or go see them because they didn't treat you right when you were growing up? Hmm. Don't make me come out there. <laughs> Let's look at a few characteristics of a merciful attitude just to see if we have one or not. Now, there is a gift of mercy and I don't have it. I do, however, have the gift of correction. <laughs> the gift of mercy can be a beautiful thing, but then you just, I mean, you just, you're just oozing with it. Well, you know, I had to learn it. I have to put it on. And I usually have to put it on a few times a day. And I'm telling you that because I want you to know that just because you're not especially gifted that way, that doesn't let you out of the responsibility of learning how to develop and work with the Holy Spirit to have a merciful attitude. We are to put on Christ. Put on the nature of Christ. And just because you were hurt in your childhood, and just because you have fear that people will mistreat you, that doesn't, cannot become an excuse to not develop those beautiful attitudes that Christ wants us to develop. Now, a merciful person does not expose people's faults for no good reason. I'm telling you what, bad news travels through the body of Christ like wildfire. We don't even need the media. I mean, if some preacher in podunk nowhere does something, I mean, everybody's going to know it within a week. But good news doesn't spread that fast. And it's a wicked evil thing that God despises. First of all, we shouldn't even believe a bad report except out of the mouth when we hear it from two or three reliable witnesses. And secondly, we don't know the whole story. And third, the Bible says love always believes the best of every person. I certainly know I've had some real lies told about me that just absolutely were not true. And I appreciated the friends and partners of our ministry who said, I just don't believe that. I just don't believe that. Why are we so quick to believe the bad thing and so anxious to tell it to someone else? It's a wicked thing that's in the flesh. And we need to not go with the flesh. We need to go with the Spirit and always do what God would have us do. Amen? So... 1 Peter 4, 8 says, love covers. <laughs> I love that. Proverbs 10, 12 says, hatred stirs up contention, but love covers all transgressions. You know, Joseph did a beautiful thing. It shows his character. When he finally was going to deal with his brothers and reveal to them who he was, there were several other people in the room when they came to Joseph to get food. And I don't know if you ever noticed this or not, but he made everybody else leave the room before he dealt with this thing with his brothers. You know why? He didn't want anybody else to think badly of them. That's a beautiful attitude. Okay, now I want us to go to Genesis chapter 9, beginning in verse 18. And I pray that as we share these next few verses, that this will put just a little bit of the fear of God in us. Because I do believe that we need to have more reverential fear and awe of God. I think that's one of the things that will move a person to do what's right, even though they don't feel like it. And I can tell you that I think it's one of the things that's missing in many Christians' lives. We've gotten almost too familiar with God. You don't want to ever be afraid of God in a wrong way. But you need to know that God is God and He means what He says. And if He says He'll bless you, He'll bless you. But if He says you better not do something, then you better not do something. Because if you do, there's going to be a result. Everything that's written is here is written for our edification. This is not just a little book of nice stories that somebody decided to write down. These things are for our instruction 
and our edification. Let us learn something here. Genesis 9.18 And the sons of Noah who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And Ham was the father of Canaan, born later. And these are the three sons of Noah. And from them the whole earth was overspread and stocked with inhabitants. And Noah began to cultivate the ground and he planted a vineyard. And he drank the wine and he got drunk. And he was uncovered and laying naked in his tent. Now. Noah's been on this boat a long time. I guess he felt it was time for a party. <laughs> he grew some grapes, made some wine, drank more than he should have. He apparently got really drunk because he took his clothes off and was naked in his tent. Just to make sure you're with me. <laughs> now watch this. And Ham, the father of Canaan, glanced at and saw the nakedness of his father and ran and told his two brothers, you won't believe what dad's doing. He is dog drunk and laying in there with not a stitch of clothes on. <laughs> so Shem and Japheth took a garment, this is so beautiful, laid it upon the shoulders of both of them and went backwards into the tent, backwards so they didn't look at their father's nakedness and shame him and shame themselves, and they covered his nakedness. That's another way of saying they covered his fault. Now watch. When Noah woke up from his wine, and he knew the thing which his youngest son had done, done he exclaimed, Cursed be Canaan! He shall be the servant of servants to his brethren. But he also said, Blessed be the Lord the God of Shem, and blessed by the Lord my God be Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. And may God enlarge Japheth and let him dwell in the tents of Shem and let Canaan be his servant. So, how much plainer can this get? Now, yes, I know it's Old Testament, but you know, the Old Testament doesn't go away in the New. What happens in the New Testament, I, I think people are mixed up about grace. Grace is not an excuse to live a sloppy, sinful life and get by with it. What grace is, is the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to do what God asks us to do with ease because it's not us doing it by the work of our flesh, but it's us calling God to come and be our partner and do the thing through us by His strength and power. Don't ever think that grace is just, you know, well, you know, grace, grace, well, grace, grace. Yeah, look, I'm, I'm big on grace. I love grace. But I get a little concerned sometimes when people think that means they can just do whatever they want to. You know, well, we live under the new covenant, and that's grace. Grace is not an excuse to live a sloppy, sinful life and think that God's going to overlook it. Grace is the power to get on your knees and say, God, I want to do what you want me to do. I want to live without unforgiveness. I want to live without bitterness. And I cannot do it on my own. Own. But God, if you will give me your grace, if you will give me your mercy, then I can be gracious and merciful to other people. But only, God, if you will help me. And I'm not going to live angry. I'm not going to live mad. I'm not going to live bitter. I'm not going to live resentful. You said I can put on mercy, and by your power, I will put on mercy. Amen? Another thing the Bible says in Matthew 18 is if you have something between you and your brother, if your brother's offended you, first, everybody say first. first. First, you go to your brother privately. It never says if somebody offends you, you go ask 14 people what they think about it. <laughs> you go first to your brother privately and you try to straighten it out between you and him. Then it says if he won't listen, you take two or three others. If he still won't listen, then you take it to the church. There's an order of how to do things. The Bible's never saying that you just let people get by with all kinds of bad behavior. That's not what forgiveness is. Now let me close this message tonight with Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, and then I'm going to pray for you. Brethren, if any person, any person, even a person you don't like, if any person is overtaken in misconduct or sin of any sort, you who are spiritual, <laughs> that's us, right? <laughs> who are responsive to and controlled by the Spirit, that's what it means to be spiritual, should set him right, restore and reinstate him. Now, we don't have any problem with the set him right part. 
Yeah, I'm into that, Lord. Set him, set him right. But then it says, you restore him, and that means restoring him. In how you look at him, restoring him. Reinstate him, and I love this, and do it without any sense of superiority. And with all gentleness. Keeping an attentive eye on yourself, lest you also should be tempted. So one of the best things to do when somebody does something just really goofy that hurts you, instead of getting all mad and having a fit and trying to make them pay for it and shutting them out of your life for several days, you can be the bigger person and say, you know what, I don't want us to have any problems. Listen, I've done a lot of goofy things myself in my life. I understand. You know, a lot of times, people hurt us and they don't even know they did it. They're just having a rough day, a bad day, and they don't even really understand what they're doing. My daughter was in a line one day at a drugstore waiting to get a prescription, and the clerk was just acting like a jerk. I mean, just grouchy, cranky, snippy, snotty. And so she's thinking on her way up there, when I get up there, if she talks to me like that, I am going to tell her that I am going to get the manager, and I am, and I am, and I am. And then God reminded her that she carries my books around in her car to give to people <laughs> that are having problems. And God told her, get out of line, give up your place in line, Go out to your car, get her a book, and handle the situation a different way. You don't know what's going on in her life. Maybe her husband just left her. Maybe she had a child that just died. You have no idea what's going on in her life that's making her act that way. See, mercy looks for the why behind the what. And so she, went, she said, you know... When she finally got up there again, she said, you know what? I can tell that you're having a rough day. And she said, I just want you to know that God loves you. And my mom wrote this book, and I'd just like to give it to you because I think maybe it will encourage you. You know what? I think there's a better way that we can handle our conflicts, don't you? Hmm? Don't you? Okay, this won't be fun, but I'm going to do it. How many of you You already know where I'm going, don't you? <laughs> You're thinking, oh, no, lady, I don't want to stand up and have everybody in here know that I'm mad. <laughs> well, you know what? The Bible says, confess your faults to one another that you might be healed and restored to a spiritual tone of mind and heart. If you need to forgive somebody, if you're angry at somebody, if you've been angry a long time, if you just got angry today, if you're an angry person, if you're a quick-tempered person, if you're a legalistic, hard-hearted person, and you've heard this message tonight, I mean really heard it, and you want to have a new beginning, would you stand up and let me pray for you, please? Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Now, just so you know, this would be the same no matter where I was at. And there is something that I'd like you to do, not to be nosy, but I want you to just take a quick glance around and see how many people are standing. And I'll tell you why I want you to do that. Now look at me and I'm going to tell you something. This is why we don't have any power in the church. Every single one of us have to start taking responsibility to be that representative of Christ that he wants us to be so he can get his job done. Amen. Every single one of us. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that every person here would have a new beginning. Lord, I believe they've heard your word, but I know that they cannot go home and do this if you don't help them, and they need to know that. They cannot do it just because they decide to do it. They're going to have to study. They're going to have to pray. They're going to have to put on mercy and put on mercy and put on mercy until they're comfortable with it. I rebuke Satan in Jesus' name. I rebuke that demon of strife. 
I rebuke all that bitterness and hatred and unforgiveness and anger. And I pray, Lord, that we would want more than anything to be like you.